Welcome to Premise Podcast. This is your host, Angelo Sophocleus. In this episode, I have the pleasure of hosting Professor Pamela Hieronymi, a professor of philosophy at UCLA. We talk about different kinds of responsibility and differentiate between reactive attitudes and objective attitudes in philosophy. We discuss what it means to be an agent and also expand on the relationship between free will and responsibility and agency. Lastly, Professor Hieronymi explains how the concepts of odd implies can and original sin are applied in her theory. Welcome everyone to this episode of Premise Podcast. Today with me, I have the pleasure to have Professor Pamela Hieronymi, who is a professor of philosophy at UCLA. She received her PhD from Harvard University and uh, she specializes in moral psychology and has also written widely on issues about responsibility and agency, which we'll be discussing today, as well as on reasons, trust, forgiveness, and the voluntariness of belief. Professor Hieronymi, welcome to Premise Podcast. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. I would like to start by, well, we'll be mainly discussing your paper agency and responsibility. In the paper, you start by analyzing the term responsibility and its various everyday uses and various meanings. Well, responsibility could indicate cause, could indicate uh, a duty or obligation. It could indicate that someone is at fault about something. Could you tell us more about how we could understand responsibility in, in philosophy and how do you, as a philosopher, understand the, the concept of responsibility? So pretty much as you just uh, summarized. So the uh, responsibility is a everyday word. And unlike a lot of everyday words, it serves a lot of different overlapping purposes. So sometimes when we say someone is responsible for something, we mean they caused that thing. Uh, and we say that even about things that aren't people. So you could say the extreme heat is responsible for the engine's failure, where that just means caused it. Um, sometimes, uh, quite differently, we mean that it is somewhat someone's duty or obligation or job. So if you say I'm responsible for feeding the dog, you just mean um, that's my job. It's my job to feed the dog. Sometimes we sort of combine those and think that when somebody's responsible for something, it's because they caused something, and by causing it, they have certain obligations. So who's responsible for this mess usually means who caused it and whose job is it to clean it up. So uh, sometimes the person uh, who caused the mess won't be the one responsible for cleaning it up. If the child caused the mess, it might be um, the parent's responsibility to clean it up, where that just means their, their duty. Sometimes uh, when we say someone's a responsible person, we mean that they're very conscientious, they can be trusted. Um, sometimes when we say someone is a responsible adult, we mean that they can bear the consequences, so to speak, of their, of their actions. And, and that gets us into the kind of responsibility that philosophers are interested in when they're worried about uh, the problem of free will and moral responsibility. They're worried about whether we can be responsible adults, so to speak, whether, whether we can be rightly incur the, so the consequences for our behavior. And then that raises the question of what those consequences are. Um, sometimes people think of them as sanctions or penalties or punishments, so that when we say he's a responsible adult, we mean things like he can be punished. Um, I'm myself most interested in what has been called the reactive attitudes, uh, and those are emotional responses that people have to other people's behavior, or uh, better, to the way in which they perceive that the other person perceives them. So if I perceive that you have disrespected me or disregarded me in some way, I might resent that. If I see that you have disrespected someone else, I might be indignant about that. If I see that you have shown someone, um, been especially nice to someone, or been especially nice to me, I might be grateful for that. Um, mm -hmm. Resentment, gratitude, indignation, those are um, re what get called reactive attitudes. 
And we have those attitudes only for people who are um, who we regard as responsible, responsible adults, so to speak. So we, we tend not to have them towards children, we tend not to have them towards inanimate objects. So that last bit of responsibility um, is what most interests me. Um, I, I, for lack of a better term, have been calling it responsibility as mattering. Mm -hmm. It's a long mm -hmm. answer to your initial question. Yeah, no, thank you. It was very, very good answer and very detailed as well. Um, I'll go back to the beginning of your answer. You mentioned that we cannot hold the child responsible for what the child has done if they have caused a mess or even if they have committed some more um, serious violation of the legal code, if they killed someone by accident or if they stole something, that we cannot hold the child responsible for that. But why can't we hold uh, a child responsible for what they have done? Is that because they, they lack agency or they lack the understanding that what they have done is morally wrong or illegal? What's the, what's the reason behind that? I mean, of course, we, we said we don't want to hold the child responsible, but, but why? Uh, it's a great question. Um... So what I had in mind with the mess was simply that a small child might not um, have the capacities of agency. That is, uh, they might not have the, the ability to plan well enough or think through things well enough to actually clean up the mess. Uh, depending, I mean, if it's, a, if it's just a mess of toys, they can probably clean it up. But if it's, um, you know, if they've broken something, they just might not be the right person to um, expect to fix it because they might not be developed enough to have the capacities to fix it. But if you're starting to ask about um, criminal responsibility, um, that's, a, that's a very different question, I think, um, and, and not one that I feel competent to speak to. I'm, I'm not a mm -hmm. legal theory, so I'm not sure what, what the reasoning um, has been in thinking that children aren't responsible when it comes to responsibility as mattering, I mean, we also, see, we also for example, don't usually um, resent the disrespect of small children uh, in the way that we would resent the disrespect of, of adults. And, the, and it's interesting to think about why, um, and different people have different theories about that. One theory is that the child is... Um, still in the process of becoming the person they are, and so is not in some way fully formed, and so we sort of hold off reacting to them. Um, my, my own thinking is that um, attitudes like resentment and indignation are in part reactions to a perceived threat of some sort, that when, a, when an adult disrespects us, that that um, uh, could be taken seriously by other adults and that it's important to register one's reaction to that and, and, uh, and some say that, that there's a react that your indignation or resentment is in some way signaling <laughs> that that wasn't okay but that when it comes to children that kind of signaling just isn't necessary um, because they, they're recognized to be just a child, um, mm -hmm. and that, so it would be silly in a way to respond with resentment or indignation to their to their um, disrespect, even mm -hmm. if it's genuine disrespect. Mm -hmm. So, if I understand correctly, resentment, um, an emotion like resentment, is part of the reactive attitude. Yes, right, and that we can define that as an attitude of emotion in response to another's quality of, of will, a response we have against something someone has done, perhaps willingly. Yes. Um, so, yeah. so I take it to be um, our reaction to our perception of the quality of another's will, where I understand the quality of their will to be pretty copious, I mean, pretty broad. So I think of the quality of someone's will as their take on things. So their mm -hmm. take on what's true and important and worthwhile. Um, so it, it's not um, sort of narrowly about their voluntary decisions. Mm 
but uh, I take it to be a broader um, thing. So, so the um, the quality of their moral personality, one might say, okay. but as manifested in a particular um, particular attitude, a particular action. Uh, and so, broadly, I'm interested in the case of the personal reactive attitudes, like resentment and gratitude. I'm interested in, or I'm reacting to how I figure in that person's world. And in the case of the more uh, vicarious or impersonal reactive attitudes like indignation or admiration, I'm responding to ha um, how other people figure into that person's world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how can we compare reactive attitude and objective attitude? In the paper, you also mentioned objective attitude. Yes. Uh, so, so I should say these, this idea of a reactive attitude comes from um, a paper by Peter Strassen that was published in 1962. It's a very, become a very famous paper in my subfield. Um, and he, so he introduces reactive attitudes um, as, in the way I just did, as uh, reactions to one's perception of the quality of another person's will. And he contrasts it with what he sometimes calls the objective attitude and what he sometimes called ob calls objective attitudes. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly he talks about the objective attitude as, and, as something that we, a, a kind of distanced posture we might take towards people. But I think it's um, interesting to think about contrast, uh, objective attitudes that would contrast to reactive ones. So if, um, I find out that my, uh, I come back to my car and my tire is flat. I may be frustrated. I may be disappointed. But if I learn that somebody um, slashed my tires, I'll be resentful and indignant. Or if a board holds me, uh, at, an unsteady board holds me as I cross some, some gap, I might be relieved. Um, if you help me cross the gap, I'm going to be grateful. So. Um, if my bag, if the strap on my bag breaks, I might be disappointed. Um, if you let me down, I'm, I might feel betrayed. So disappointment, um, relief, frustration, those are all attitudes that we can have towards events or things that have no will. Whereas betrayal, gratitude, resentment, those are all attitudes that we have in response to things that have a take on us, that have that, that have us in mind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really, I think, a very interesting distinction in, in our emotions. And it was Strassen who, who put it on the table and then identified as a way of being responsible, a, a, a way in which we use that word, um, being such that these reactive attitudes are appropriate to be had towards you, to be such that your quality of will matters to other people in, in a certain way, namely in the way that they respond to you uh, with those reactive attitudes instead of the merely objective ones. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if this is relevant, but I've been reading about uh, stoicism recently, and it seems to me that to hold an objective attitude is to hold a stoic attitude. Just to say that, okay, if I have a flat tire, just sometimes things happen and I don't need to be angry or annoyed because of that. It just happens. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a valid comparison, you, you think, or is it taking things a bit too far? Uh, no, to the extent, so I, I'm also not an expert on stoicism, but, uh, but to the extent that I have a picture of it, it's, that does seem to me a valid comparison. Um, Strassen talks about, so, so he, he thinks that there are cases in which like children or people who are suffering from severe mental illness, um, maybe, maybe people suffering from dementia, there are cases where we naturally um, shift to a more objective attitude. So again, you don't resent the child or you don't, you don't feel betrayed by the unreliability of some, someone with uh, dementia. But he also thinks that, um, he says, we have a resource, what he calls a resource, to be able to adopt a more objective attitude even in other kinds of cases. So... Um, and, and one of the things he says is to avoid the strains of involvement. And I think most people uh, have experience with this. So there's, you have that coworker or that 
extended family member who is just more than you want to deal with. And so you, you, you start to treat that person as an issue or a problem. And right? you kind of step away from, from allowing yourself to be upset by what they're doing and you start treating them just as, as, as you would a, um, an impersonal pro- You try to start treating them as you would an impersonal problem in your environment. Um, and Strausson notes that that's a difficult thing to do, but it's also, I mean, sorry, it's difficult to, um, to maintain that um, uh, kind of constantly, but it is a resource we sometimes use. And it does sound to me sometimes like that's what the Stoics are uh, holding forward as a kind of ideal. And you also talk in the paper about whether we can compare reactive attitude to uh, sanctions or penalties. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, so I think somewhat because of the way in which the word responsibility, as we said at the, in the beginning, uh, ranges across these different uses, and some of the uses include being rightly targeted with sanctions or penalties, um, I think people have tended to think of the reactive attitudes as a form of sanction or penalty, so that, um, you know, so I may not be able to impose a fine on you or uh, punish you in some other way, but I can at least be re- uh, indignant with you or something like that. And, um, and I think that's a, a, a bad distortion of interpersonal relationships, at least of adult interpersonal relationships. Um, I mean, we do, some people do do that. Some people do think of their emotions as kind of penalties that they're imposing on you to make you feel bad for what you've done, you know. Um, but, but that, to me, is guilt tripping and not really appropriate for ordinary adult interactions. So though people can use these reactive attitudes as penalties or punishments, I think it's important to see that that's not what they are in the first instance. So people use them that way. And then also when you're the target of them, when somebody's resenting you, it's easy to feel like you're being punished in some way. But I find a helpful analogy in trust and pride. So if I'm, so trust in the sense of having a lot of confidence in somebody. Um, So, or, um, if I trust my children, that is, I have a lot of confidence in them, or if I have pride uh, in what they've done, that's going to help them to build their self-esteem. Mm-hmm. But I don't take pride in, in their accomplishment in order to build their self-esteem. Mm-hmm. I take mm-hmm. pride in their accomplishment because it was impressive or because they did a great job. And if I try to adopt some attitude in order to build their self-esteem, that won't be pride, um, mm-hmm. and it won't build their self-esteem because they'll they'll have this. I mean, if they're astute, they'll see that I'm just doing this because they could use a little boost, right? And that's not that's not genuine pride. So the analogy is that things like pride and trust can have a social function of, for example, building people up, but that but building people up is the wrong kind of reason for having those attitudes. They're, the attitudes themselves are not expressions of my desire to build them up. They're expressions of being impressed with or confident in. Mm-hmm. So too, I think that resentment and indignation can have a social function of, of disincentivizing certain forms of behavior. But that's not why I do it. I don't do it in order to punish you or in order to incentivize you. I'm upset with what you've done because um, of the way it affects, of, of what it says about me, of how it how it affects me if it's resentment or or what it says about somebody else if it's indignation mm-hmm. so so it, so i think it's easy for us to experience being the target of these attitudes as though we were being punished in some way but i think that's a bad misunderstanding and it puts the focus in exactly the right place because it, uh, sorry exactly the wrong place because if you think oh i'm being punished that puts all the attention on you the wrongdoer instead mm-hmm. of where the intention needs to go, which is on the hit that has been taken in the status of the victim. The victim's been treated in some way, poorly in some way, and needs some attention and some recognition of the, of the poor treatment instead of bringing the attention back on 
the wrongdoer as though they're being treated badly in some way. So should we understand the victim to be acting or reacting involuntarily, like they are having a natural human reaction to what the wrongdoer has done to them? Uh, so that's a really interesting question, and that's what m most of my work to date has been um, trying to better understand the way in which we're active and the way in which we're passive with respect to these states of mind. Mm -hmm. um, so on the one hand, I don't think uh, reactive attitudes are voluntary. They're not the kind of thing you can do for just any old reason, So, uh, and you can't you can't take pride in order to build someone up and you can't resent uh, just in order to make someone feel bad, um, though, though you can use your emotions in those ways. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you were to treat them just like digestion or allergies or something that, you're, you are complete, that are completely involuntary, you wouldn't be rightly understanding the way in which those attitudes are expressive of your take on the world. Uh, so they're expressive of your will. So I um, like to call them non-voluntary. So they're not voluntary, they're not involuntary. I, I like to say that they're non-voluntary activities. So they're not passive, they're non-voluntary activities. And, um, and so I think that, um, that belief is like that. Belief is in some way the clearest case of something that when you believe that you know, the, the economy is failing, say, um, or that, that uh, or it's going to pick up, the economy will pick up. When, when you form a belief, it's your take on what's true. Um, you can't believe for just, you can't believe just anything. You can't believe that, um, that it'll all work out in order to get a good night's sleep because you don't think your need for sleep shows that it'll all work out. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, your belief isn't just like a headache or, um, or, or a cold that you caught. It is your answer to the question of what's true. And, uh, and so in, in some sense, it's up to you. Uh, when you change your mind about what's true, your beliefs will surely change. Mm -hmm. And what about attitudes which are, I don't want to say fake, but not genuine? Let's say, uh -huh. um, let's say someone's child has caused a mess, but not a, not a huge mess. Mm -hmm. And so the, the child's parent is not very annoyed, but she or he wants to act more annoyed than they actually are to make the child understand what they have done. So mm -hmm. if we analyze the emotion of being annoyed, to some extent it's genuine, but to some extent also the, the parent over does it. So ca how can mm -hmm. we analyze that? How can we understand that? Yeah, so those are interesting cases. So it, interestingly, people can act, right? We can pretend. And it's especially easy to do if you have a, if you have a little bit of it going already. If you're already a little resentful, you can, I mean, part of acting is sometimes directing your attention in certain ways, talking yourself into certain things. Um, I think of our ability to do that as in part our ability to manage our own emotions, which, which we certainly can do. We can think about them and either suppress them or emphasize them or try to reframe things to think about things differently. We, we, we're, we're able to do all those things. And so, uh, you know, knowing that certain attitudes have certain functions, that pride will build people up, that resentment will um, make people feel bad, right? We can engage in certain kinds of management and certain kinds of, of acting to try to either guilt trip or teach a lesson, uh, which may, in the case of a child, be a um, perfectly appropriate thing to do. I'm, I'm less sanguine about it in the case of adults. Um, or we can also, you know, build people up or ma make a lot of them. And so part of what fascinates me is the interaction between what I think of as these two forms of agency, the more basic one, where it's the, um, the taking things to be true, taking them to be important, worthwhile, offensive, impressive, um, disrespectful, that initial form of agency, and then the more indirect or reflective managerial kind of agency. And we're constantly working at both of those levels. And that to me is very, that's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And moving on to agency a bit and 
yeah, the concept of agency and holding someone responsible for something. I'll attempt to bring the two together by an example. Um, let's say that last night when I came back home, I, I left my keys in a different place than I usually put them. And um, this morning I spent some time looking for my keys and for this reason I was late for work. So I was speeding and um, when I was driving and because I was late for work, I ran a red light and caused uh, an accident. So there is that causal chain right there that if I left my keys in where I usually leave them, I wouldn't have caused uh, an accident. But we don't want to say that the fact that I left my keys in the wrong place caused the accident or that I could be held responsible for leaving my keys at the wrong place. So how can we be sure that someone is uh, responsible for what they have done or that someone is at fault for what they have done when we have infinitely many events in this causal chain that might bring about an action for which they're being held responsible? Uh, great. Yeah, it's a great example of showing um, the, the way in which causal connections reach forward and backwards. They also reach side to side. I mean, causal connections go everywhere. Um, and, um, and some people think of the task of figuring out who's responsible for what as the task of figuring out where the causal connections go. Um, and that's a very natural way of doing things. Um, when you start to think about human action and philosophy of action, it can become, um, I mean, a, a, as you just pointed out, each action sort of spreads out in the world causally in a way that it's very difficult to trace out. Mm -hmm. And so some people, and I'm on this side of things, think that, that the inquiry should go in the other direction that we figure out where action starts and stops by th figuring out what people can be responsible for. So it's true that your leaving your keys in the wrong place um, had as a downstream consequence the accident, but that your responsibility for the accident doesn't trace back to your leaving the keys in the wrong place. So, so that was a, an example of, um, of a series of, of your own actions through time. There's a famous uh, example in the literature by Anscombe puts an example of a, a person operating a pump to replenish a water supply, to poison the water supply, to kill the inhabitants of the house in order to um, help bring about the end of the war. So, you know, there's a whole story here that you see, mm -hmm. but there's what's happening is one person is moving his arm and operating a pump and doing all these things. So you wouldn't want to say that that action is ending the war, even though, you know, it could as a matter in the same way that you're leaving your keys yeah. could have ended up with the, um, on the other hand, you would want to say that they're poisoning the inhabitants if the inhabitants end up poisoned. Mm -hmm. um, and so exactly where we draw those lines, I think is a difficult question and I'm among the people who think are going to think that that we draw those lines by thinking about what it's reasonable to hold people responsible for, rather than thinking there's some causal break there, and then responsibility follows the causal story. So, so given these scenarios, if someone, we could pose the question that whether if someone lacks the opportunity to avoid committing an action, if it's fair to to penalize them for for committing that action and that i think is related to the problem of free will and moral responsibility and a very simple way to put it is um if someone lacks the free will to commit a wrong action uh, whether it's right to hold them morally responsible so how could we deal with such cases when uh, someone could not have done otherwise but is still being held responsible for for the action they committed. Uh, so, so that's the hundred thousand dollar question. Right? That's <laughs> the that's the free will and moral responsibility question that I'm working on a big book about. Um, but, but a, a beginning of an answer is to notice that once you separate responsibility as mattering, as I was calling it, that being such that the quality of your will 
matters to other people and that they are correct to respond to it with these characteristic reactive attitudes. Once you separate that from penalties, then you don't have the same natural thought that someone needs an opportunity to have avoided the thing for which they're being penalized. So penalties and sanctions are things that humans institute and attach to certain violations and then enforce through voluntary behavior. So um, if, I, if I have a late penalty for my students, that's I've, I've made up a system. I say, if you turn your paper in late, I'm going to have this grade deduction. And then deducting that grade is something I do voluntarily. So once you have that kind of system, it's very clear that fairness requires that the person, uh, at least in most cases, fairness requires that the person have had an opportunity to avoid being burdened by, in this way that I'm going to voluntarily burden them. I don't think the same thing carries over to the reactive attitude. So in, in this case, I think trust is a good example. So uh, if, sorry, that's my cat. <laughs> no worries. Um, that's so, so I think trust is a good example. If, um, if somebody is unreliable, just, you know, they're, they're very flaky, they don't have good time management skills, they're not very good planners, um, I'm not going to trust them to do certain jobs. It may be that they're unreliable, so to speak, through no fault of their own. Right? I mean, it could be that they became such an unreliable person because of formative circumstances that they had no, um, no real opportunity to avoid. Um, that doesn't make my distrust of them unjustified or unfair, because in fact, they're unreliable. <laughs> And my distrust is just the reflection of their unreliability. There may be something unfair in the whole situation. There may be something for us together to try to address to help them be a better person. But there's nothing unfair or inappropriate in my distrust. And I want to say the same kind of thing holds true of, uh, of my resentment, of my gratitude, of my indignation, that it's a reflection in me of the quality of will in the other person. And as long as that reflection is accurate or apt, there's not a question of its fairness. It's not a further question of its fairness. And I know we've, we've talked about children in the beginning of, of the discussion and about people who suffer from mental illnesses. But again, how could we understand moral responsibility and understand what kind of agency is involved in um, in reactive attitude when it comes to children and people suffering from mental illnesses. Uh, and also a question that we will be required to answer, I think, in the next decade or so is uh, the kind of agency that is involved in artificial intelligence. Let's say if an autonomous robot or if an autonomous car kills someone, do we want to hold them morally responsible for what the robot has done? Do they satisfy the criteria for agency that we give to ordinary people? How will we deal with robots when they get more into our lives and become more autonomous? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question that I have um that I would like to think more about. Um, right now, it seems to me that, um, that there are kind of two steps to get to creatures who matter uh, in the way of responsibility as mattering. Um, one step is, is that you need to have a will, which is to say you need to be such that you have a take on the world um, and your place and other places and, and, and others in it. Um, so that I tend to call answerability. Um, so when you do something, we need to be able to ask, why did you do that? And you need to you know, be such that you could, if you were, had linguistic ability, provide an answer. Um, and, I, and so I think a lot of creatures are like that. I think, um, I think my cat is like that. <laughs> um, certainly, um, if anything gets to be called it artificial intelligence, or you know, general artificial intelligence will be like that. I think the, my thermostat is not like that. Um, the, the simple spring that operates my furnace um, 
I don't think it's answerable. I think it's just is a mechanism. Um, so the first step is answerability. But then in addition, there's the kind of sociability that human beings seem to mostly um, display, which is that we have an idea of what we can expect of one another, what we can, de what we can demand of one another. And when those expectations are um, violated, that's when we have these reactive attitudes. Um, so that means that we are living with a kind of implicit understanding of something like a, a framework of expectations and demands that we are holding one another to, and that when those are violated, we take it personally in, in some way. So as things now stand, um, creatures who are as intelligent, rational, and language using as we also all come with our form of sociability. That seems to me a contingent matter. It seems to me possible that there could be intelligent language using uh, creatures who don't have that form of sociability. And the kind of popular conception of a psychopath is like that. They're super smart, but don't care about how other people, don't care about other people, don't care about how they figure into other people's worlds. So, um, so I think that's a thing that... <laughs> we need to be investigating as we get closer to building new a new intelligence is what is this particular form of sociability that we display that enables us to whatever limited extent we do to live peacefully with one another mm -hmm. um what makes that what makes that tick so to speak it's and it's not um it's not the same thing that just enables us to be efficient and effective planning agents um to use to use Michael Bratman's term, it's not. I, I don't think I don't think rationality and intelligence and the ability to solve problems and get things done is the same as mm -hmm. the ability to be um, to stand in these relations of mattering. Mm -hmm. Good. And coming toward the end of the discussion, you've also introduced in your research the concepts of odd implies can and original scene. Could you explain how this fit within your theory? Uh, that's also a really big question. So in philosophy, it's generally thought that, uh, as it's put, ought and flies can. So if you ought to do something, it must be the case that you can do it. Um, that slogan is, is used a lot. Um, it has some root in the thing you were pointing out about penalties. It seems unfair to penalize somebody if they couldn't avoid the penalty. Um, it also, I think, has some root in commands and requests. So it seems unreasonable to request of someone that they do something that they're not able to do or to command someone to do something that they're not able to do. So I think there's places in which it's true or, or pieces of truth to it. But just generally speaking, I don't think it's true. So taken the claim that you can't be obligated unless you have an unless you have the ability to satisfy that obligation um, isn't true in an awful lot of life right so if you think about any number of role based almost any role based obligation the the obligations of being a police officer the obligations of being a parent the obligations of being a president or a dean or a chairperson um, those duties don't shrink to fit the limited abilities of the people who happen to fill those roles. Um, those obligations are fixed by the needs and interests of the people being served by the people in those roles, of the children, of the citizens, of the department, etc. And so if somebody is in the role who lacks the ability to do a good job, things are just going to go badly. <laughs> but, but, it, but, the, but the expectations of the role don't shift. So I tend to think of morality like that. I tend to think of the demands of morality as the as the demands that fall on each of us as people trying to share a limited a world of limited resources peacefully. And the fact that a particular person because of their, you know, moral development is a hazardous, messy, contingent affair and sometimes people show up at adulthood not having learned how to share with others, not having learned how to lose gracefully, not having, you know, just too petty or small or, or selfish or something to, to, to do the job well. 
And I don't think that means that the moral demands don't apply. I think it just means that that person and the people around them, things will go badly. If you thought of morality as a, re as a request, or if you thought of it as punishment, then that's going to seem unfair or inapt. But because I don't think of it in any of those ways, I don't think it's unfair or inapt. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, when I told some of my listeners that I would be interviewing you, they uh, requested that I ask you about the good place. Oh, yeah. Obliged to end with that. Um, how was the, the experience in uh, working in the series and putting philosophy into a more practical use? It was really fun. Um, it was really fun. It was a, it was a, it was a tremendous stroke of good luck that I got to partake in that, uh, participate in that. Um, the uh, Mike Sher, the the creator of the show, uh, was super smart and interested in philosophy, and um, and he um, got most of the actors and all of the writers' room were also really interested in it. Uh, so it was extremely gratifying to be able to uh, take what I know and kind of distill it for him in a way and point him here and point him there in a way that he could then run with. Um, and yeah, I mean, I had I had relatively little to I mean, I did not look at scripts, for example. I didn't give feedback or notes on any of the scripts. Um, I met with them. I met with Mike. Uh, before the before he had even assembled the writers' room and talked with him about three out for about three hours about moral philosophy and and moral philosophers and then I I came into the writers' room to talk with him about the trolley problem and talked about some other stuff um, in, before as in the summer as they were before they had really written season two and then I came back for season four but I had really pretty limited input but they um they ran with it and it was yeah it was the, the short answer was it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. that's amazing so yeah um professor hieronymi i would really like to thank you for participation in the podcast of course thank you <laughs> thank you i really enjoyed the conversation me too thank you very much you have just listened to premise podcast Subscribe to Premise Podcast on YouTube and make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter and Facebook. The podcast is also available on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Please consider supporting Premise Podcast on Patreon to help bring philosophy to the public. See you next week. Thanks for listening.